Hello, everybody. Thanks so much for joining us to learn about Compass Control Pro. This is the Compass Control C1 training. We're going to begin by introducing you to the system. Compass Control is a control system based on iOS devices that is designed specifically across these seven core applications. Presentation spaces, bar, restaurant, digital signage, operation centers, house of worship, and residential AV installations. You're going to use Compass Control anytime that you want to have a touchscreen to control your system. And specifically, we get so many customers and, and the, the thought process nowadays is, hey, I could do this on my iPhone. And so that's what Compass Control is really all about now. It's been out for over 10 years now. And so we were right there at that initial iOS wave. Um, we were ready. We had our surfboards. And uh, so it's all built to use the iOS device as the brain to the system. So any application that uh, a touchscreen is the desired user interface, uh, Compass Control can do that utilizing the iOS device, the processing, the power, the cost effectiveness, leveraging that for your control system. It offers full AV system control. So covering a variety of uh, control formats, IR, RS-232, TCP, IP, and voltage control, uh, different manufacturers speaking different languages, uh, I, um, you know, HEX and ASCII and different APIs, et cetera. So you can integrate all of these things together under Compass Control Pro, giving you one app to rule them all, if you will, right? Where everything nowadays is, hey, there's an app for that. Well, put them all together and that's what we give you. You're gonna see what the UI looks like. It can be built either through our drag and drop modular programming method or through our custom user interface development. Uh, just takes more training is all uh, to, to get you there to build those custom UIs. And you can even customize your module programming. Some nice features that people really like about Compass Control is that we do have a built-in web browser so if you have a product that integrates with a web page, for example, or a room scheduling that is web page based without uh, Flash, of course, uh, you can do that in the uh, within the user interface of Compass Control. And we also, through that same element, support RTSP streaming video, many RTSP streaming video formats. Um, so if you want to view your surveillance cameras in the Compass app, you can do that quite easily, in fact. And of course, because it's manufactured by Key Digital, we have native control for Key Digital devices. And so if you're going to be using Key Digital products like our AV over IP system, for example, then it just makes sense to leverage that capability without the addition of any hardware. So that's something to consider here, you know, uh, your design considerations when working with Compass Control Pro. How many IR, RS-232, or TCP IP devices? Well, TCP IP devices, as you'll learn, is going to be controlled directly over the network from the iPad to the device. But IR and RS-232 and your voltage devices as well do require a port, uh, an I.O. port. We have them. We'll show you in the hardware section, different port or different uh, hardware controllers, master controllers, as we call them, have different quantities of I.O. ports. Um, with your system, with your key digital uh, system, AV system, especially, are you going to be working with a product that has the master controller functionality built in? Excellent. Uh, or if not, then we have external controllers of various sizes, form factors, and price points. Um, what third party components do you need to control? You'll want to check that across our list of modules on our website. Um, and how do you want to program it? Well, have you done this before? Are you certified to do custom programming? Are you certified only to do the modular programming? And I'll show you where you gain those certifications all online, all free of charge with Key Digital. Because it is iOS based, um, you need to make sure that your Wi Fi coverage is. Um, very strong on the job site, right? Because you don't want to have the user walk into an area where the coverage is, is non-existent or uh, weak uh, because it will affect the system. Um, also, many applications nowadays, uh, folks actually are using 
hardwired Ethernet adapters for their iPad. Yes, that does exist if you're not familiar with it. Uh, Belkin is one such manufacturer. Uh, and then you can provide a hardwired Ethernet connectivity into the iPad over that lightning connector. And going back to the programming, how do you want to program it? Well, um, if you yourself have only obtained the, the base level of uh, certification, we have a whole network of in-house, um, well, in-house in is your company, excuse me, is referred programmers that we could uh, send you to and, you know, can even give you a few options to make sure you find the right fit for your jobs. And that way, you know, you're able to focus on your core business and work with people that it's just going to be a win-win situation for you and your customer and for our programmers alike. So, <clears throat> Uh, I mentioned the list of the modules that are available. We have reached out to many, many manufacturers across the industry to uh, have them join our Compass Alliance partnership. Um, and basically the goal with this is to uh, align ourselves with top manufacturers that are the best at doing what they do. Because uh, Key Digital with our Compass control system, we're not trying to you know, be the be all end all where we offer the audio DSPs, we offer the lighting system, the shade system, et cetera. We want you to be able to work with the manufacturers you want to work with. And at the same time, make it drag and drop the module for their newest products, their uh, IP-based um, products usually is, is the direction we go with the module. So it's all very modern. And we even give a good, you know, we align ourselves with a few different manufacturers within each category. So you have good uh, options for who you want to work with, but also products that achieve various price points of systems that you may need. Um, <clears throat> so the webpage to, uh, to view all of those modules is keydigital.org slash compass slash modules. And even if you're not C1 certified, you could view the list. You could take a look at screenshots of those uh, modules. And um, if you'd like to download the modules themselves, that is when you need to be C1 certified. And once you are C1 certified, the web page adds those additional columns for the module download, as well as the module programming guide. So sometimes there is additional information you need to put in, information that perhaps needs to be collected from the device you're controlling. And we teach you how to do all that in the module manual. Very good. So let's move on to the certification and training coverage of this Compass Control Introduction, C1. So uh, we're here, C1, I I exactly as it says here. It's, a, it's, it's an introduction so that you can begin specifying and selling systems of Compass Control Pro. Uh, C1 Plus, we actually jump you into programming modular systems, okay? So it's modular programming and installation. Uh, uh, and we actually have content up there across a few different application types. Uh, C2 is custom module development. So you'll learn how to create your own IP strings, RS-232 strings, or IR, how to capture or import Pronto Hex for various IR devices, how you can create your own libraries for controlling those devices. And then even if you need to attach those codes to a module so that you have a pre-built UI for controlling that device, you could do so all through C2 programming or uh, uh, training. And then continuing your education to the C3 level, that is your custom UI programming. Uh, you will become the custom UI programming professional. With that, um, we go through it all there. We go through, hey, here is a button. It can have four different graphical states with or without text. Um, here's, uh, here's how to make it move and dance as you desire. Here's how to kind of do all these things button by button or create a macro where just in one place you can control all these things. You press one button, all the others pop up kind of thing. Here's how to utilize variables in the system. And, uh, and so we do, uh, we go through it all. Uh, that course obviously is a bit longer, but it is all available for you there online. And, uh, just while we're here, you know, for me, my suggestion to you is if you're wanting to take this seriously and, and do the programming yourself is to uh, go all the way through it, because the most powerful thing you could do, in my opinion, is program and see in the modular drag and drop method 
but customize it after the fact, which is all totally possible. And that way you're, uh, you're really optimizing, minimizing the amount of time it takes to do your pro programs, but then able to customize it to uh, really have a, a more custom UI and uh, for, for your project, for your end user. Um, so uh, now folks that have already, as I mentioned, gone through this and repeated and repeated and repeated and just get better and better and better as time goes on. These are our master level Compass partners for installation and programming. We have a list of them on our website. Uh, so take a look there, keydigital.com slash compass slash installers, and you'll see our recommended partners. And you can always also re reach out to us sometimes, you know, each of these uh, programmers has an application or two that they really specialize in. And you want to, you know, ask us who we recommend from this list. We are happy to provide you with that recommendation. And if this is your goal to end up on this list, then again, it's just a matter of repeating the process going through that learning curve for installation and programming. And, uh, and you know, this is a huge help to us as well when we could add your name to this list. So it's, once again, a win-win situation. So I mentioned before that Compass Control is an IP-based system with an iOS brand. So we rode that initial iOS wave. We grabbed our surfboards, like I said. Um, and coming out at that time, we were able to benefit, we are the beneficiaries of everything already being solidly, solidly network-based in, uh, in, in, in the industry and beyond, uh, in, in the world, really, isn't it? So let's talk to you a little bit more about what is Compass Control and what does it mean to be an IP-based system that uses an iOS device as its brain. All the project information loads into each iPad, into each iOS device, not into your master controller, not in your control processor, okay? They actually just take commands from the iOS device. So all the information loads into the iOS device, not just the graphics, the variables, but also the commands for controlling each device, okay? Um, and all the controllers, they live on the network. Um, you could have as many controllers as needed, iOS or master controllers. Um, we also support global IP communication. So if your uh, iPad, um, excuse me, if your site has a uh, site IP address, then your iPad can communicate into and control the system from outside of the local area network. Um, with the master controllers, there's no master slave. You don't have to choose one uh, piece of hardware to communicate to. And if you have a very large system, have it then distribute the, the communication to other uh, controllers. You don't have to do that with this system because every device just has its own IP address, right? Uh, and so we'll give an example of that in a moment. But also, as I mentioned earlier, the, I, the iOS, if it's controlling a device over the network, not over IRRS-232, it can just communicate directly to it. It doesn't need to go through that master controller. So here's an example of this. Uh, if you have an IR and RS-232 device, uh, in this case, we actually have one master controller, our MC-1000, and we have another master controller that is either our CX-800 or one of our 4K AV over IP uh, master controllers. And uh, in this system, and it's fine for them to mix and match within that same system as this uh, as depicted here. And in this system, if the iPad needs to control devices A through D, they're all connected IR or RS-232 to the master, the MC-1000. And that has its own unique IP address. So the iPad, you press a button that's going to control one of those devices A through D, the iPad begins sending those command strings to the MC-1000 on its unique IP address, basically telling it like, hey, port number two, your IR, and here's the IR burst that you're gonna send. Or port number six, your RS-232, and here's the baud rate and the string. Same thing, if uh, now the user presses another button that is going to be communicating to devices E, F, or G, well, 
That's a separate master controller they're connected to, um, which has, once again, its own unique IP address. And I wanted to show this, uh, you know, both of these controllers, because again, you can mix and match, but also just so you could see right off the, the gate here that, um, you know, we have one that if you like to work with 3.5 millimeter ports, one that if you'd like to use Phoenix connectors, uh, we have options for you. And uh, we have a hardware discussion coming up here in the course where you'll see more details on these different master controller options. Now, how does this look in the Compass Navigator software where we do our programming? Um, you can see here, we build a tree on the left here. We build a tree where we have our MC1000, for example, and we just enter the IP address of that MC1000. And here in the properties for that MC1000, which is something you, anytime you click this MC1000 on the far right of the screen in Compass Navigator, you've got the properties for whatever you've clicked last. And so if we need to change it up so that port two is RS-232, uh, port one is RS-232, excuse me, port two and three are IR, uh, or voltage sensor or voltage trigger as we go down this column here. Uh, if you can see my mouse, that is uh, all just done very easily. You don't have to really configure anything um, in, in the master controller itself. It's through the Compass Navigator software because the master controller, again, takes its orders from the iPad, which is the brain. Uh, similarly, uh, one of our three port controllers, CX800, or one of our AV over IP encoders or decoders, here we see the exact same kind of process, just having its own IP address and choosing the configuration for each port. Now, if you're controlling a TCP IP device, then once again, we don't use any ports of the uh, master controllers at all. So now with Compass, you always need to have at least one master controller. You always must have at least one master controller. Even if you have all IP controlled devices, you still need one piece of hardware in the system. Uh, but here we see an example of just one IR TV, one IR controlled Blu-ray player, one, two, three, four, five, six different uh, IP controlled devices or systems. And so, the properties of those devices look a little different. You get to enter the IP address of the device itself, not of the master controller. And uh, then the iPad uh, communicates directly to those devices, not via the master controller. And uh, if there is a two-way driver, as we see in uh, these devices here, they all have a two-way driver. So those devices are also communicating back to the, uh, the, the iPad. The iPad is the one running the two-way scripting for parsing those devices. So now you've learned a little bit about Compass Control, what it is, perhaps what it is not. And we've kind of scratched the surface on a few things, looked at the iPad once or twice, but let's do a deeper dive into the Compass Control user interface on the iOS devices. This could be an iPad or an iPhone, uh, for example. And really the user interface, you can, you go, you could go one of two options with it. If you're gonna do modular, it's gonna look like what you see here at the top, slightly larger iPads, okay? Now, <clears throat> With modular programming, and we'll walk more into the, the layout, uh, you know, page by page of the modular UI, but with modular programming, um, you're basically, it's a predefined UI, and you add the modules to that system. The modules are, what are the devices that I am controlling, okay? So when you drag and drop those modules in, we begin to build a tree of our scenarios, uh, in the modular programming, modular uh, scenario connectivity tree, like each scenario is like, it's a way that you are using the system, or it could be kind of a zone entry um, in, in, in a multi-zone, like a bar restaurant type system. Um, <clears throat> when you press the buttons that are part of this pre-built UI, uh, you can choose to have uh, add macros to those buttons so that when I press a button, not only does it advance me in the UI, but it also could execute events and actions to configure the room as needed, for example. And you can spec you can you can create the list from top down. If you see my mouse here again, once again moving, <clears throat> you can you can have that priority of what's at the top, you know, what what's really important here for the user. Okay. Now with custom programming, again, you go all the way through your C through C3 training. 
And with custom, honestly, the iPad's a totally blank palette, okay? Um, and this is how Compass Control actually started. Um, it was completely, completely open, um, which meant you could build a UI like in this example where you have, um, you know, in this example, I love to give it because the integrator landed a, a great project, a great uh, client. Um, and uh, instead of thinking in this commercial application, like, hey, what am I going to do for them? They just went straight to their website and they borrowed from their branding on their website themselves. And then with custom programming, they could even import their own images to make icons of the uh, of the displays in pizza sauce colors, right? So, um, so really, you know, it's a wide open palette. And but those things, of course, do take a significant amount of time. Uh, for those of you who have done it before, you we all know. Um, every time you have to build a new button or a new page. You also have to even think about how is that going to look? And so just having that known, I personally love programming fully custom projects that utilize the graphics from our modular layout. And we actually give you all of those uh, demo projects of, our, of the Compass uh, app in the Compass Navigator installation package. So, um, so we give them to you as custom projects as well, if you'd like to do that. So um, this is actually what I've been calling modular is short for modular version 2.0, because this is actually our third generation user interface where the first generation was that fully custom, as I mentioned, and you had to build everything from scratch, but we did provide kind of a you know, in all of our trainings and all of our demonstrations was always using one user interface um, that is kind of, it was like you could swipe your fingers to go zone through zone. Um, then we released our modular programming, which introduced the drag and drop. You didn't have to totally build everything from scratch. But that user interface really only fit into a few applications. So then it came time to develop our third generation user interface. And that's the one we've been using uh, for a while now. And it has still uh, passed the test of time aesthetically. Uh, it looks very modern, very clean, light colors, as you can see here. But most importantly to me anyhow, is that this user interface has passed the test of installation as well. We, when developing this, we put our minds together, our expertise, our experience, and we made sure that this UI is going to work in these seven applications that you see here, okay? And then before it was even released publicly, we actually took the next steps towards installing it in these applications as well through the beta program, and it worked. And of course, there was feedback and uh uh, from the beta testers that we uh, applied to improve. That's that's as it works, right? But that's what's most exciting to me about this is that this UI, I show here some examples from various application types, but this UI works in these applications. And so here's, here's what we get into with this user interface. It launches into our scenarios page. These large buttons that you see on the screen, we call them the scenario buttons. These are the different ways that you are using the system. And we see here in this conference room, for example, it's a single zone system. So they have the option to press presentation, conference call, video conference, or just to press device controls. And if they press presentation, well, if the room is off, of course, you want it to configure the room to be ready for a presentation, similarly with conference call and video conference. And so that is totally optional for you. When you build these scenario buttons, which you don't have to build them graphically, they're gonna be there for you. You just tell us, and this is something you'll learn in the C1 plus programming, but you, you, know, you get to type in the text, it says presentation or conference call, you get to choose an image, but <clears throat> Do you want it to have those events and actions? And then it's gonna build that macro for you that you later customize that macro for all those events that you wanna happen as you press the button. And when you press the button, those events will happen and it will also advance you to the contents page. 
Here's the contents page where on the left, the contents is like a menu, a sub menu of each option within your, uh, your chosen usage of the room, your chosen scenario. So it's like the table of contents, right? And so this list of contents buttons, this uh, vertical list there, it could be, uh, you know, you could press those buttons to view the various modules in your system, the devices you're wishing to control, right? You could press those buttons to even just press the button, make something happen, like run through another macro uh, is uh, something you could do with that as well. And each time you press that, um, usually, typically what happens is it adjusts the module space, which is that primary chunk of real estate there. But also you may notice here the volume icon. So, okay, great. I'm doing different things, controlling my system, uh, changing what's on the screen in front of me, perhaps, or the different configurations of the room. How do I control the volume? We have that speaker icon right there. You press that. That brings up the volume control panel where um, each scenario, you can choose what is the associated volume device for that scenario. And you can just hit a checkbox that says it's into, uh, incremental only, or it is with a volume slider, because if you're just doing IR control, well, the slider is not going to really do anything for you, right? And so that's very easy to choose. All right, here's my volume device for my different each scenario. Um, and now regarding that module space, you know, various ways that that could be or uh, be utilized. It's, it's a page for controlling device or the system though. So we have different types of, uh, um, of contents that could go there. One is a multi-zone device. So you can actually see the entire list of outputs and inputs um, that we use this a lot in bar restaurant, for example, or large applications. Um, sometimes it's just going to be, hey, I have a switcher and these are my sources. And for that, we have this, what's called an AV endpoint, where you actually, this isn't a module for a specific TV or AV receiver or four by one HDMI switch. This is a property selection. Hey, this is an AV endpoint. And so, and then you could just tell us what type of, uh, what icon you want to use when you drag the different sources into this endpoint. Uh, you could also just attach it to a specific device, what we call a single device. And again, this is all in the C1 programming where we define these things more. But then you can have something like just, hey, here's the module that Key Digital's development team has made for a specific device like a video or teleconference appliance or an audio DSP or an AV source. So now that we've introduced you to the system and established how it works, and shown you the user interface options, what most people use, modular, drag and drop, or really just told you, hey, you can do anything you want if you do a, a custom. Um, let's look at that piece of hardware that goes into the hands of the user. The iOS app for Compass Control Pro can be downloaded for free. So just open up the app store and search Compass Control and you will see that. And it's going to be the best sales tool that you have for uh, Compass Control, other than, of course, your actual experiences, because then you can show them what you've done in the past. And that's super exciting stuff. Because it is an iOS app, you know, the great thing is users are so accustomed to just flicking left or right or swiping or pulling their finger up and down. And you can do that in Compass Control. We give you the elements for that through your programming, through a list or a slider, for example. And you see these list of uh, six, seven different applications. Well, those it's not just a, a, a pretty graphic. You can press each of those. That's a button to enter a demo for that specific application type. And then once you begin building up your uh, repertoire of um, installations, you could actually add those into the archive. Each iPad could have up to 12 projects archive 
where you can actually switch over into that. Say you have a job site that you're kind of going in and out of. You could just add that to your archive. And anytime you enter there, you can um, press the load from archive button to begin controlling or just using it as a demonstration for that uh, those uh, potential sales opportunities. Now, each iOS, how, you, you know it's an app. You know the app has demos. How do you, you know, how do you load your program into the iOS device, right? Well, that starts with the device ID. Every Compass Control iPad has a unique device ID. Uh, this is found in the Compass Control app, okay? And so when it comes time to program it, you can see there, oh, this is the iPad the device ID of that iPad. So let me make sure I type this in as a property of that iPad, because when it comes time to load it, as we'll show you, that's where it's gonna go. Um, the device ID needs to get married to a license. The app is free, but there is a cost for activating each controller, right? Um, and that is done through our license, KD Pro CL, uh, KD Pro CL1, KD Pro CL4, KD Pro CL6, and KD Pro CL8. Pro, Compass License, 1, 4, 6, or 8, because you do have multi-packs, which help you increase your profit margin. So you take the device ID of the iPad, you go to our website, uh, you know the, that plus your registration key, uh, which we could even email to you, or you do get a physical, like a bifold, almost like a gift card, and you type, you know, start with the key, and then next to the device ID, now it's activated and it'll give you the success message that you're ready to program to that iPad or load to that iPad. Now that device ID, unfortunately, is not automatic just by generating Compass Control or uh, by downloading the Compass Control app. You do actually have to generate that device ID. And it can be done two ways. Um, the iPad could just shake hands with the master controller on site. So if you have an existing job site, the customer wants to add another iPad or two, they could do that without you going out there as long as they know the IP address of one of the master controllers, any of the master controllers, they could type that in. So often people leave a label on their master controllers of, hey, here's the IP address. Or, you know, your customer is likely going to call you and say, we want to add an iPad. How do we do this? And you can tell them, all right. Here's the step-by-step. -step. And we actually have a video tutorial on this. Now, the other option is um, instead of the iPad shaking hands with the master controller, let's say you don't have the hardware on the network yet, the iPad can also shake hands with a PC, Windows PC, running the Navigator programming software for Compass Control Pro, as we'll show you here shortly. And uh, for both of these methods, uh, there you must have either 192.168, a, a 10 dot, or a 172 dot, 16 through 31 type network to generate that device ID. And once that handshake, as I'm calling it here, takes place, you're going to have that device ID. Um, and just make sure you follow that tutorial because uh, there's a few steps that you have to take to getting that done. And now your iPad is licensed. So... Uh, how do I get the project in? Well, I do my programming on Compass Navigator uh, PC software, um, either modular or custom. And when I'm ready to go, I upload it to our key, uh, to the uh, Compass Control server. Because of course, Apple doesn't really like you to uh, connect your USB into the iPad and load something into the iPad, right? It doesn't really work that way. So um, you load the project um, from your PC programming software. It's programmed in a, in, a, in a computer, not programmed on the iPad. And it goes up to our server. And when it goes up to the server, the server checks, okay, let me make sure every device ID that's in this program is licensed. Otherwise, hey, you don't have access to the server, right? So, um, so it checks the device ID and um, now it's up there in our server. Now, the user or the integrator, they press a button in the Compass setup menu that says load from server. It's going to say, hey, server, here's my device ID. What is the latest project that's loaded to the server for me? And it retrieves that. So it's all time stamped, right? And, uh, and it retrieves that. And now it's in the iPad. So uh, this is a larger look at the setup menu. Uh, the Compass Control app, you press projects, load from server, and then it's a step-by-step -step process, actually. The first step, very quick, usually, is it connects to the server. 
and, or if you're not online or for some reason your firewall is blocking our server, it's just an Amazon web server we're actually using, um, then, uh, then it'll fail. But, uh, but typically it's very fast to connect to the server. Then it begins loading the project. You go through zero to the hundred percent there as well. And then the, you actually have to press the button, either update master controller, or you can just run it as a demo, a GUI demo only. So, uh, so you're able to just, this is those scenarios where you really just want to show your client or, or maybe you just want to make sure everything graphically is working in your uh, testing before finalizing your program, right? This is how you would do it. Uh, so once you press that next update master controllers, then actually the iPad syncs all of the project info into each of your master controllers. And it provides a list of authorized device IDs. So if there's five iPads in the system, here, here's what they all are so that the master controllers know who is allowed to communicate with it. So that's part of the, of the header. When the iPad communicates to each master controller, there's a header says, hey, here's my device ID. And uh, if it's not an authorized device ID, it's not going to work. Obviously, the iPad's going to ignore it. And that is a, kind of a, a additional security mechanism built in to compass control against off unauthorized use. So uh, we're not going to actually program here, but I want to just give you, you know, the scratch of the surface of what that entails um, when you are programming a compass control system. Uh, once you are C1 certified, you will download the Compass Navigator software suite or the Compass Control software suite. So you have to be C1 certified. You download it from our website. There's going to be five total items inside. Compass Navigator is the programming software. That's where you make your projects. And then four managers that go along with it. The TCP IP manager, RS-232 manager, and the IR database managers are where you can either create your own uh, strings for IP and RS-232 control, uh, where you can manage those. You can open existing and tweak them if you need. Um, the IR manager, where you can learn uh, IR codes um, from your uh, remote if you need, or import Pronto Hex. And the master controller uh, manager, that's where you can set the IP address of the master controller and load firmware and that kind of thing. Um, you basically can do that now as well through our key digital management software. So it's it's one and the same. And typically we steer people towards the key digital management software. But since there's nothing wrong with keeping it included in the software suite, we do include it here as well. And actually, uh, some of our older model master controllers, maybe that's a scenario where you would use the master controller device manager versus KDMS Pro um, key digital management software. So um, here. Uh, we have the Compass Navigator software. Um, take a look at that screen. You can see there's there's quite a bit there, okay? It, just like other softwares, it, it takes some time to get used to. Um, and alert, there is a learning curve, but very, very important. I don't want you cursing us, so please have a widescreen monitor, okay? Um, so uh, it operates in Windows only, Okay. So you need to have Windows, a Windows computer in order to run this. It is one of the, yes, ironic elements of Compass Control is that it is iOS user interface, but programmed on Windows computers. Again, we use Compass Navigator. And from there, you can either choose, is this going to be a modular drag and drop program or a uh, uh, full custom uh, uh, project and uh, and this is what it looks like when you start a new project or, you know, oftentimes you may just open an existing project, save as and, and work off of that for a new program. Um, there's plenty of advanced uh, features that are supported in Compass that, that uh, our advanced programmers and programmers with loads of expertise really do appreciate. Um, for example, our variable support. We support integer, string, Boolean and floating type variables. Um, the variables can be just local within each iPad, or if it's a variable, uh, holding value of something that should be shared amongst all the iPads, for example, uh, something that would be local is, okay, I press the dining area and now I'm in the zone one, you know, selected zone equals one. 
But what about the volume of the dining area? Well, you know, let's say it's zero through a hundred. If any iPad wants to, uh, you know, enter the dining room, they should all know as one user adjusts the volume, that variable could be broadcast, shared, so that every iPad knows, oh, the, the volume in zone one is now 25. On those, event, on those variables, you can also place events in actions. So as the variable equals 25, now our slider value updates. So it goes from 100 down to 25, okay? Just in one example of uh, a, a, an event being stored on a variable. Um, we do support index and arrays so that um, if you're familiar with this concept, you know, okay, there was a volume for zone one. There's also a volume for zone two, a volume for zone three, et cetera, et cetera. You could either have multiple variables called volume zone one, volume zone two, volume zone three, three variables there. Or you could just make one variable called zone volume and it will be an array of an index called zone. And so now instead of a variable being the, the classic analogy being a variable is a cup or a glass. <clears throat> Why? The variable has a name, cup or glass, but the value, it just holds that value. So what's inside? Is it water? Was this vodka? Was it gin, right? Um, so, so that's a classic example of a variable, but an array variable is more like an accordion folder where, okay, this is volume and there's different slots. Zone one, 25, zone two, 75, zone three, 65, right? So uh, there you have it. Um, <clears throat> and uh, all of the bi-directional drivers are written in uh, in C language. And we do have a guide on this if you are a um, C programmer, uh, that if you need to see how those are written, we do have a guide we could share with you, but you, you would need to know basic C programming for that. And then there's a few key digital isms in there. Um, so you do your programming in Compass Navigator as I went over already with you to get that project into the iPad, that PC uploads it to our server, right? And that's just one of the three ways that you actually can interact with our server because it's, it's, it's a pretty nice feature here. Um, another way is, you know, I'm programmer for stage one of the project and I want to hand it over to programmer for stage two of the project. When we are both C1 certified with the same email domain and the same uh, company name, we will share, uh, we will both be uploading and downloading to and from the same company folder. So it's a way that you can, you know, hey, all right, I made a tweak. Let me upload it to the server. Great. Okay, I'm ready to pull it down and I pull it down into the, a different PC. Um, and similarly, of course, because it's being uploaded there, it stays there. It could you could use our server as secure file backup, right? And uh, what you do there is there, there can only be you know we load it by name, right? So um, just like in a folder on your computer, you can't have two files by the same name. So if you are somebody who is a little more efficient with your projects, you just keep naming them the same thing, and every time you upload, it's just going to overwrite that existing file that's there. But if you are somebody who likes to, you know, have backup for things and see the progression of things, you could put today's date on the end of your project name and you'll see every version of that that you've uploaded with each date. And uh, so, as I mentioned before, the iPad is the brain for Compass Control. So really, when the iPad retrieves that project from the file, it knows everything. And then when we, again, update the master controllers, that iPad syncs that information into the master controller about, hey, here's what you need to know about this system. Um, but there are, there is an instance of sometimes the master controller, the MC1000 anyhow, is capable of running events without the iPad. And those are scheduled, scheduled events. And so that information would go from the PC into the MC1000. And that would be part of your programming step. And we do have a tech guide on our tech guides and videos page on how to do that. 
Great. So now you really understand everything about Compass Navigator PC software. What is the system um, about the iOS app software? So you really know it all so far, except for the hardware. And uh, so we're going to take a quick look there as well, starting with our KDMC 1000. Well, MC 1000 is the only master controller of the Compass Control System with a little bit of intelligence to it. Again, the iPad is the brain for us. So, um, so you know, you don't need that much intelligence in the controller. But the MC-1000 has it because it can support scheduling as well. That is why I lead with the master controller MC-1000. Um, so this device has, uh, so of course, just like Compass Control, it is land-based. It plugs in, it lives on your network. There's these front indicator LEDs that are very useful, um, including these uh, six IO lights. Anytime a command goes through IO port one through six, the respective LED light will blink. It's actually activated by voltage. So it's a great troubleshoot as far as, hey, I'm not controlling this device. Well, let me make sure this LED is at least blinking because that would indicate that the command is going through. Maybe the command's not proper if the device isn't controlling, or maybe it's a wiring issue down line. Um, we have the uh, USB uh, port in the front there that you plug in. That's where you set the IP address, load firmware, etc. There's also on the front a built-in IR learner. Hold your remote about six inches or four to six inches away from that, and you can capture IR codes if it's a uh, device remote that we don't have in our system yet. We show you how to do that in the C2 videos. Um, the six multifunction ports, very, very flexible. Show you about those in a moment. One port here that is a dedicated RS-232 port and a three pin relay if you need to control uh, like a screen with normally open or normally closed positioning. But those six uh, IO ports, very important. They're very flexible. Uh, they could be set as IR output, as uh, bi-directional RS-232. They could be a voltage trigger to just control a device that, you know, needs voltage present to maybe make the screen drop, for example, or not present to make the screen lift back up. And it could also be a sensor for voltage composite video or PCM digital audio. So if you have an application where, hey, when the projector turns on, it's going to send voltage backward into the MC-1000 so then we could execute a few other events to happen. You would do that by having the MC-1000 set up as a sensor. I uh, wanted to show you real quick with the built-in IR learner uh, what that capture looks like. It's very nice when, when you are in the IR database manager and you begin learning your IR codes. You even see this visualization of the IR burst, which is just really excellent as far as making sure that things look uniform and you're working with a uh, capture uh, that is um, very, uh, that, it, that looks reliable, right? Now we move on to our CX-800. So the CX-800 is a smaller three port controller. I really like this one. It's very, very flexible um, and compact. So you could kind of, you know, with the MC-1000, you're almost, Envision that in your racks, but the CX-800 uh, can be in the rack or located, uh, you know, decentralized, right? Take it away from the rack. Um, and uh, especially because it's PoE powered as well, and it has that second LAN port. So if you only had one network cable to a specific zone or area, you could feed it into this and then connect your, your next device that requires IP control into the LAN 2 port. It acts as a two-port switch. So um, again, the front indicator LEDs that work the same way as I just described with the MC-1000. Um, it is a 12-volt uh, uh, power. So I tell you that why? Because the MC-1000 is 5-volt power. So the IR is, is maxed out at 5 volts, but not the CX-800. You do have adjustable voltage. It starts at 5 and then works its way up. Um, the CX-800 is also pretty flexible as far as we use it for other purposes at Key Digital as well. Uh, you could, it has an open API, so you can talk to it from your third-party control system, um, and you can send an IP string that will then convert to IR RS-232. Uh, we also use it as a uh, AV over IP 
control interface. So your third party control system could speak to this device and then it will send um, send commands to the respective encoders, decoders, transmitters, receivers to adjust the video routing. But that's not of importance here in the compass control discussion. But you may notice in the 4K AV over IP, here, I guess that is our segue, isn't it? Uh, speaking of AV over IP, is that we do build essentially what is a CX800 into all of our 4K AV over IP products. So here we have the 822, which only has two IO ports, the 922 and the 1022 uh, that have three IO ports. And so we showed this example early in the C1 course here, where, you know, if you're going to be specifying an AV over IP system, uh, and you, considering key digital here, you're going to have, you know, one encoder per video source, one decoder per vi video display. So here we see a uh, 10 by 15 AV over IP system. And if you got 922s, that's 25 times three, 25 devices times three IO ports. That's a 75 port control system. that's already there for you to leverage by utilizing Compass Control Pro. And so, and beautiful thing is you're going to have your end encoders in your rack, most likely. So you're going to have a good amount of control ports there, plus decoders out and about throughout the whole system or the whole job site rather. So you're going to have control ports just everywhere for your taking. And it, when you leverage it, it really makes key digital the most cost effective 4K AV or IP system in the market. So it's uh, very, very powerful that way. And all of these systems, as I mentioned earlier, we set them up with the key digital uh, master control device manager, or now uh, in the last few years, we've really standardized where we just have a single setup software that is the key digital management software pro. Download that from our website, KDMS Pro as it's called. You can connect the USB or connect over the network, connect the USB and hit the uh, scan for the device. Set the IP address, set the name if you're going to have multiple master controllers, MC1, MC2, MC3, or MC encoder 1, MC encoder 2, encoder 3, etc. Uh, set the names, update the firmware if you need. It's all very quick, very, very well done in the key digital management software. And that really gives you everything you need to know about Compass Control Pro. Thanks for attending the C1 certification course.